All right, thank you, Dr. Gose, for that great talk on how uh, venetoclax is being used in higher risk MDS and AML. So we're gonna repeat the poll. So this will come up again. So get ready to answer, please, everyone. So which answer is false? The combination of venetoclax and azacitidine is indicated for AML patients ineligible for intensive chemotherapy, rarely induces tumor lysis syndrome, is approved for higher risk MDS, increases myelosuppression compared to azacitidine alone, and improves overall survival versus placebo plus azacitidine in therapy naive AML. Okay, great, and the answer will come up in the chat now, great. All right, so let's get started with questions. So given this uh, increase in sepsis uh, in MDS patients versus uh, AML patients, how do you think we'll be selecting patients for the combination of these two drugs versus just hypomethylating agent alone in, in our real world, world practices? Um, that's actually a very pertinent question, so thanks for that. Um, I think it's important to have patients that are um, able to um, comply and to come into the clinic um, on a weekly basis to be sure that they will um, call you if they're having a problem. Um, and it's so often necessary to actually reduce the venetoclax dose. Um, so we started off with a day one through 14 regimen, but very often patients need to shorten that to days one to seven. And we also probably very often need to space out the beginning of the next cycle. So to delay the next cycle by a week or so. And um, I think there may be a subpopulation of high-risk MDS patients that are too frail to, to tolerate this regimen. Great, thank you. Along those same lines, Dr. Roberto Ferro is asking, can you comment on these dose adjustments for neutropenia with the combination? You kind of outlined in your talk this uh, stepwise delay of the cycle and then the venetoclax um, uh, dose reducing in number of days. Um, but can you comment on uh, a little bit more on the specific ways that you've been doing that? Um, so we learned a lot from the AML trials where um, venetoclax is given in 28 days. Um, during 28 days of the cycle, so the entire cycle. And actually, most patients don't tolerate that um, at all as our experience outside of the trial. So um, for MDS, it's, since they always start neutropenic, it's been even more challenging. And our experience is that um, if you delay the cycle by one week and the patient is still severely neutropenic, we would um, give the venetoclax only as a seven-day um, dosing. And um, after the second cycle, if the patient is still severely neutropenic and we've delayed the second, the beginning of the third cycle as well, then we would actually reduce the um, azacitidine dose as well. And interestingly, in the upcoming phase three trial, um, the companies actually decided to switch that around. So they're asking us to um, reduce the azacitidine dose before reducing the venetoclax dose, which is um, exactly the opposite of has been done in the AML trials. And I'm not quite sure that's going to work well, but we'll see. So in your experience, almost nobody gets through uh, full doses with more than one cycle. So you start off that way, but then immediately you're reducing the majority of the patients? It's quite difficult, yeah, I think so. Great, so we've also had quite a few questions about antifungals. So um, you had mentioned that in the trials they were using echinocandins, uh, but Ava Hellstrom Lindbergh is asking, why not uh, using azoles by just decreasing the venetoclax dose? And uh, can you comment more on the practical nature of using antifungals in this context? Um, that's actually a clinically very relevant question, and I, th I find it quite difficult to answer that. Um, so the recommendation is if you use posoconazole as a, um, as a prophylactic that you should reduce the venetoclax dose to 100 milligrams, and there have been some pharmacokinetic um, um, explanations for that, or there's been some evidence for that. 
Um, I find that a little difficult. Um, and usually we don't give azoles to our MDS patients as a prophylaxis on a routine basis. Um, and our experience actually is that um, the fungal infections in this group of patients are not as much a concern as bacterial infections. So all of the um, data coming out of the, the 1B trials was that most patients had problems with bacterial infections, not so much fungal infections. Got it. And from a practical nature, especially with COVID, trying to give a kind of candens, uh, with IV dose requirements for a lot of the agents that we have available, um, I think, you know, the, the azole question is even more uh, practical. For sure. I agree. Great. Um, Dr. Alejandro Magillis is asking, have you seen cytokine release syndrome? Sorry, Mario, um, we'll cut you off. <laughs> have you seen any cytokine release-like syndrome uh, using this combination? I haven't seen that um, so far, and I don't, I don't, haven't seen any evidence of that either from any of the under, other centers, and also not from the data monitoring committee. Great. Mario, please ask your question. Okay, Katarina, the clinical trials uh, you examine have shown uh, complete responses, complete hematologic responses. Do you know if uh, any patient either with AML or MDS uh, has been examined also at molecular level? I mean, if uh, the complete response means uh, disappearance of uh, the mutant clone or not? Yeah, thank you, Mario. That's a very pertinent question as well. So um, in the AML trial, I believe um, quite a number of patients were MRD negative, and this data coming out of our relapse refractory um, MDS trial has also shown to a lesser extent that patients um, can have a reduction of their mutant clone. Um, but I think for MDS, we can't really expect them to in the absence of allogeneic transplant to really become MRD negative, as I understand MDS disease, um, where the bone marrow more or less is completely clonal. So, so this re reinforces the opinion that it should be a bridge to transplantation. I think it would be an excellent bridge to transplantation. Um, of course, not as many patients as in M AML will be eligible with MDS, but um, sometimes you actually um, mis misinterpret a patient and, and they're sick because of their disease burden and when they get this treatment then they do become eligible to transplant and we used to see that with quite a number of patients in azocytidine alone although you do lose patients on the way to transplant if you just do azocytidine instead of upfront transplant and I think venetoclax plus azocytidine will be a good option to bridge to transplant in the future. Okay. Great. Um, what other combinations do you think venetoclax could be uh, combined with in MDS? And you had mentioned at the end that uh, there are triple combinations potentially being tried, but any other combinations? Um, so there are triple combinations being tried with for those patients that have IDH1 or 2 in, um, mutations, and there's data coming up at the ASH meeting this year um, showing from these trials. Um, there's ongoing combinations with venetoclax and FLT3 inhibitors like gilteritinib, which is not that common in, in MDS, of course. And um, interestingly, um, for the TP53 mutated patients, there, there are some initiatives trying to use MDM2 inhibitors and venetoclax or MEK inhibitors and venetoclax um, to try to be a more specifically target the TP53 mutated patients, which is quite common in MDS. Um, and in general, venetoclax functions as a, as a chemosensitizer, so in myeloid disease, so I think uh, we're going to see a lot more combinations also in intensive chemotherapy, like um, with 7 plus 3, with CPX351, um, with FLEC-IDA combinations, and all of these um, combinations are being tested and will be updated at this meeting, actually. Wonderful. And when you start adding all of these on top of each other, uh, the toxicities, obviously, we worry about the number of toxicities patients will have. Has that been coming to fruition, or uh, these are tolerable combinations when we start adding three or more agents together? 
Um, that's the million dollar question probably. I think that actually the combinations of IDH inhibitors of venetoclax and HMA is, is pretty tolerable. The question is, do we really want to do that in the beginning or should we save the IDH inhibitor for the relapse? If it's a patient that can't go on to transplant, we might be precluding this patient from, from receiving a targeted therapy further down the line. Um, Concerning MDM2 inhibitors, I don't have any personal experience. We don't have access to that drug, so I can't comment on that. And I think um, the trials with intensive chemotherapy, as far as we know, have shown that it's, it's very feasible to combine intensive chemotherapy with venetoclax. All right, fantastic. So I think that's all the time we have for questions. We really appreciate your excellent talk and this live Q&A session. Thank you, everyone, for uh, submitting all of your questions, continue to do so. Um, we are now going to move on to Dr. Sar Gill's presentation. So he'll be talking about the role of CAR T cells in myeloid malignancies, lessons learned from lymphoid malignancies. So we'll start with his poll question. Everyone get ready to answer. So which of the following surface markers is specific to malignant myeloid cells? Please select one of the following, CD33, CD123, CLL1, NKG2D ligands, or none of the above? Wonderful. So we'll have this again after his talk, and now we'll listen to Dr. Sargill's uh, role of CAR T cells in myeloid malignancies. 